sit down on this, but if I do, I'm going to be sitting on my remotes. <laughs> You're going to change the channel? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to change the channel. <laughs> uh, so this is lesson number two on, on Bible verses that are hard to believe. And if you have an outline there in front of you, you know that what we're going to be looking at is John chapter 8 and the first 11 verses. Okay? So... Gospel of John, chapter 8, and the first 11 verses. So uh, let me just read that for us, and then we'll back up and begin to consider uh, what, we are, what we have before us today. All right. So Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees... Brought uh, him, brought to uh, Romania. The scribes and Pharisees, verse 3, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say thou? you think? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, your Bible may not have that last sentence in there. It's not in some of the oldest manuscripts. So he simply stooped down on the ground and, and wrote something on the ground with his finger. Okay? Uh, verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, uh, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Come on. Did Jesus really do that? Give me a break. What do you think? Does this give, did Jesus just kind of give us a lesson here that says, doesn't matter what you do in life, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Is that the, the lesson here? No. Hmm. All right. Have, have you ever had any questions about this story that I just read? Have you ever wondered about anything? Yeah. Uh, I just think it's impossible for her to sin no more. She's human, you know. She's going to sin. Mm, so that's, a, that's a hard thing to say. <laughs> You're good now, but just don't sin anymore. You know she's sitting on the way home. <laughs> she thought so. Hey, so you just brought up something that I that I had at the very end of the outline. So you're gonna have to hang on for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Hmm. Okay. So what? As is, it, this story, as with every story. And every section of scripture is all about the context, context, what's actually going on here, okay? So, when they brought, now who is they? What, who, who brought this woman to them? Scribes and the Pharisees. Who were they? Sinners. <laughs> yeah, they were sinners, yeah. They were so they were in the in the culture of the day. Who were the scribes and Pharisees 
in the <laughs> eyes of other people. Well, yeah. I just studied that. Yeah. And the Pharisees were um, were right by the law. Sure. They went. I mean, the Pharisees were more political. They were the wealthy. Yeah. The, and they they didn't believe in the resurrection, but they were by the law, but they were. <laughs> they were more political. Okay. Where the Pharisees were, uh, they were by tradition, they mm -hmm. were more by the Jewish tradition, but they were more by the Mosaic law. They lived their lives more by the first yeah. three books of the Bible. Okay. All right. Larry? They were the church officials. <laughs> the church officials. <laughs> well, so they they were obviously the guys that that that, and they were in the culture of the day. They were they were the spiritual leaders, the church leaders, however you want to put it. Gary, do you have something? Religious, religious leaders, religious leaders, right? Yeah. So they were they were up there on the pedestal when somebody ma imagined a righteous person, quote unquote. They had it was it was the Pharisee. The Pharisee lifestyle was the righteous lifestyle. Today, you know, it might be people that, that might say, you know, oh, yeah, that's a that's a do gooder. Yeah. That's a churchgoer, a do gooder, or whatever. You know, the way they see people as a, a, in a certain way that never make any mistakes. Of course, as soon as you get into church, you find out, no, that ain't true. <laughs> right? it's, 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 yeah. They look at um, our, our views of being. Yeah. The one I could think of is like Charles Stanley. Um, okay. John Haley. Or yeah. One of the leaders yeah. of these mega churches. Sure. Yeah. That's what I would. Yeah. And what are and what are people usually looking at when they when they make those kind of judgments? I mean, can we see into the hearts of men? No. no. So they, they see the externals, right? That's what they're seeing is the externals. Oh, this guy talks the right way. He prays the right way. He preaches a good sermon if it's a preacher or whatever. But those are the external stuff. Well, so these Pharisees, you know, had the ex boy, they had the external stuff down. They, they were killing it. They knew, according to their own rules and regulations, not necessarily God's rules and regulations. They just had it down pat. They knew how to be a righteous person. Because they had all these rules and regulations that they could keep. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, it was like oil and water. Because Jesus cut right through the externals, didn't he? And he went to the heart of the matter. And... What kind of reaction did he get out of the scribes and the Pharisees when he did that? Did they embrace him and go, oh, thank you for revealing our sin to us? No. No, they didn't, did they? So who did they become to Jesus? Enemies, right? And that is the context in which they bring this woman to Jesus. The point of the whole exercise for them was to not give us some beautiful theological, uh, you know, uh, discourse on the grace of God, which I think is there in this story. But, but that wasn't their purpose. Their purpose was to set a trap. Yes. It's a trap to test him. They wanted to catch him in a place where they could accuse him. Now, at this point in time, Jesus was really gathering quite the following. And it says that, you know, if you read in the previous chapter, it was a habit. Jesus is obviously in Jerusalem right now. And he would teach in the temple courtyard. And then at night, he would go across the Kidron Valley into the Mount, the Mount of Olives and uh, maybe perhaps in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that region, 
And he would sleep there under the trees at night. And in the morning, he'd get up and he'd go back across the Kidron Valley and through the gate and go and teach again. And back then, the scripture says, you know, I, Jesus didn't do what I'm, what I'm doing. I have a hard time sitting when I'm teaching. I have a hard time standing still when I'm teaching. I'm moving around all the time, right? But Jesus sat. That was the culture then. He sat and people gathered around him. So that's where he was when he brought this uh, when they brought this woman. So at this point in time, the Pharisees were desperate. They were desperate to do what? To find fault. To destroy Jesus. They wanted to destroy him. Wanted to just decimate his reputation, his teaching, every, his influence, everything about him. They just wanted to completely destroy Jesus, okay? So I, I give you three things. They wanted to destroy his prestige, his power, and his authority. Because Jesus was building all those things. He, had, he was building prestige in the eyes of the people. He was building power so that when he spoke, people really, really listened. And with power, he could almost be in the same thing, authority. He had all those things going and they were desperate to try to just destroy everything that they could about Jesus and, and, and what he was building there of his prestige, power, and authority. Okay, so that kind of sets the initial context. Okay? Now let's let's take a deeper look. Let's take a deeper look at what actually happened. Okay? So the story is fishy to me. What is it? What did we read now? They brought this woman that was caught in adultery. What did it say? It was got very specific. In the act. In the act. That's an X-rated movie. <laughs> Think about it. How do you catch them in the act? <laughs> this story is fishy. They set her up. You know, the government has done that. I remember back in the 70s, the first time I, re I remember the government starting to do this. They wanted to catch crooked politicians. So what would they do? Anybody remember what they started doing in the 70s? It was a setup. They'd offer them some money. And they would go, they'd find a motel room someplace. And they had hidden cameras. And the FBI guys were in another room next door. And as soon as that politician accepted bribe money, boom, and then they came. The sting operation. Right? It was like with DeLorean. Yeah, yeah. They, same type of thing, right? That's, that's what this starts to smell like to me. It was a sting operation to, in order to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, catch this, this person that they brought, this woman, to Jesus, all right? So right off there, I want you to have a little bit of a skeptical hat on here. As they began to tell Jesus about this situation, okay? About what happened. All right? Number two, where was the man? I often wondered about that. There were supposed to be. Yeah. If it was wrong for the woman, what about the guy? Yes. Yes. It's a good point. I don't know. There's a lot of question marks here, isn't there? Yeah. So we're not gonna we're not gonna get absolute black and white answers here, but all these question marks start popping up. 
what's going on here? What did that, what actually happened? Was it a sting operation? Was it a, the family telling them you can, you know, we want our daughter punished so you can catch her in the act of doing this? And then why not bring the man also? Now, when they came, what did they use as ammunition besides the actual adultery act? What did they say to Jesus? That Moses commanded, right? Like what they said. <clears throat> Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you have to say? So there the trap is set. Here's what the law says. Now what do you have to say, Jesus? But they already quoted half the law. Okay. So the question is, did they state the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth <laughs> about this law? Okay, so there's more than just that one simple statement, okay? So, number one, is it true that stoning is absolutely required in any and every circumstance of adultery? If by the law, no. It's not true. Look, at, but here's the verse that they, so in Leviticus 20.10. Somebody want to go there and get that one for me so I don't have to... Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. Go ahead. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Okay. So there's there's this, right? But it's not just the woman. It's the man. They both shall be put to death. Okay. Um, there are others uh, citing different circumstances. You know, I, I, you can almost imagine that this is basically a trial. Imagine it's a courtroom setting. And Jesus is the judge. And the Pharisees have brought, this is the prosecution, have brought this woman there. And, and there's, there's a lot of different circumstances that can be involved in a trial. You've, you've probably very familiar with the idea of this is a circumstantial evidence case, right? right? Circumstantial evidence case, which what? It means, well, they don't have any physical evidence linking the person to the crime or, or whatever, you know, no fingerprints, no DNA, nothing else like that. But they've got a, a ton of, of things that would lead you to believe that nobody but this person could have committed the crime. That's, I don't know, about the quickest way I can describe a circumstantial case, all right? There are other circumstances in which this was not called for, the, 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 the putting to death. But here's what would happen in the culture. Num number one, could one person make a claim that caused capital punishment to be put upon that person? No. no. At least two, right? So had multiple people making the same claim. What did they do to Jesus? The night they, they arrested him, it was all bogus, but they got more than one witness to come to, to uh, give the Sanhedrin enough cause to pass judgment upon Jesus. All right? Okay, so it took more than that. Now, so let's say the person that had the trial and they were found guilty of the crime. Then what would happen? And let's assume that stoning is the method of execution. Alright? Then the person who made the accusation, and now the, yes, and, the, and now that, you know, the person, the, uh, it, they've been found guilty, they had to get up, be willing to throw the first stone. To, uh, to execute, you know, the sentence upon that person. Guess what? They did not have to. They could decide, even though the person was found guilty. No. I am going to spare that person's life. And so historically, capital punishment was rare. Most of the time, the person refused to throw the stone. If you were the one 
that. So in, 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 our, in our country right now, I would assume, I don't know if they do it any other way in some states, but it's lethal injection, right? Is that capital punishment nowadays for most places? Yeah, so lethal injection. So that's a little more sanitized, but you would be the person if, if you know, you made the accusation, it was proven in court, the person was found guilty, so you got to show up at the execution date and push the syringe in yourself. And so they would, uh, uh, you know, that, in that sense, that took it you know, to that extra, extra level, and I would imagine some people would, would decline that. And if you decline, well, then the person's, you know, not, not going to be... Put to death. That's the cultural thing that happened back back then in this in this context in which we're reading this story. So when Jesus said, "Let him who is without sin cast the first stone," they very well understood what Jesus was saying. Okay, you're saying this woman's guilty. You, she was caught in the act. So step up, throw the first stone. Hmm. Think about this some more now. All right. So when Jesus said, "Let him who is without sin cast the first stone," how big of a context does that? What, what did that mean? Did Did Jesus ask him if you if you've you know never sinned in your life and step up and cast the first stone? If that was true, who would have been the only person worthy of casting the first stone? Nobody. <laughs> yeah, only Jesus himself, right? right? So I think the context is much more narrowly defined to the case, to the court case that we have before us today, okay? So number one, we need to think that there had to be no conflict of interest. If a judge finds out that they have some personal dealings or business dealings with somebody that is brought before them at their court, what is their duty or obligation? Recru recuse. Is that the word? Recuse themselves. Because they have a personal interest. Now, if you, you go to the you know, politicians nowadays, I don't know if you can find a politician that doesn't have a conflict of interest. <laughs> Honestly. They all seem to have conflicts of interest. And use the laws. I'm reading, you know, it, it's constant. You know, there's no such thing as insider training, uh, trading laws with our politicians. They do it all the time. They get word about something that's going to happen before the public knows it's going to happen, and they either buy or sell stock based on that. And they'll tell their family members to do the same thing. Happens all the time. Conflicts of interest everywhere we go. Well, guess what? These Pharisees and scribes, they had a huge conflict of interest in this. They didn't care about the woman. Care less about the woman. <coughs> what they cared about was catching Jesus. They had a huge conflict of interest in this. And so when Jesus said, He who is without sin... I think he's talking about any of you that don't have a conflict of interest. Step up and throw the first stone. So, interesting that they refused to do that. Would have you been surprised if we read that story and some self-righteous Pharisee immediately got up and started throwing stones at him? I wouldn't have necessarily been all that surprised. <laughs> but they didn't. Because they all looked in their hearts. What does the scripture say there? The uh, uh, verse, uh, let's see, verse 9. And they which heard it, that's the scribes and the Pharisees, when they heard Jesus say, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. Now, in the, in, in the, um, the, 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 the being convicted by their own conscience. So there's the context. They were at least honest enough to look into their own heart and recognize, you know what, I've got a conflict of interest here. 
they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even up to the least. They left. Yes. Okay. This was before the Holy Spirit came in. Like on the day of Pentecost, came okay. down to the church, yes. Okay. For them to be, because they were under the law. Mm -hmm. So for them to be convicted by their conscience, mm -hmm. wouldn't the Holy Spirit have, wouldn't the Holy Spirit have to have had something to do with it? Interesting. So, <clears throat> here's my first thought when you began to ask that question. They were, you know, operating under, under the law. That's the context that they brought to Jesus. Moses said to do this. Now, what do you say to do? That's how they were going to try to trap it. Their right? hearts were hardened is what my thought was. Yeah. Jesus used the law against them. Yeah. So, their self-evaluation was, you know what, we were dishonest in how we caught this woman, how we brought her to Jesus, how we did not bring the man, but just her. We were dishonest. So Jesus caught them in their own, you know, uh, uh, you know keeping of the law, so to speak. Uh, in, that, in that sense, that's what kind of begins to really make sense to me in this whole story. And so, the, uh, as I said, the context of this whole thing is the case before us, which is, you know, thinking of this whole scene as a, as a, as, as a you know, courtroom case. The context when Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, is in the context of this case. Were you honest and how you brought this case before me? Or do you have conflict of, of interest uh, in how you brought this case before me? And they recognized that they were not honest, that they did have a conflict of interest. So now they all leave one by one. And Jesus, and by the way, some of you may be burning to, 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 for me to tell you, what did Jesus write on the ground? I have no idea. <laughs> None of us do. It, it, if I said anything to you, it would be pure speculation. Pure speculation. In my, you know, in my dreams, what did he write on the ground? Grace. <laughs> did he? No idea. No idea. Okay, so then they have all leave. Now it's just Jesus and her. And he said, where are your accusers? Remember, it was the accusers that had to step up and throw the first stone. Hey, Mark. Yes. That's, I have one answer. And it's yeah. speculation. Yeah. yeah. He did say that because the Pharisees brought the woman, yeah. he was going to have that perhaps one of them was the other part, you know, he was the man. Oh. One of them was the man. Hmm. And what Jesus did was write the name in the book. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if that's <laughs> the truth, but I like that one. Because, yeah. <laughs> hey, Jesus knew, right? Yeah. He saw right through those guys, regardless. You know, and if, if, you, if you know you're, you're lying and you're hiding a part of the truth, but you become to the point where you realize that somebody else knows that. That's an uncomfortable situation to be in, right? Um, okay, so where are your accusers? <clears throat> and he says, um, has no man condemned you? And she says, no man, Lord. <clears throat> and Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I always remember an old uh, Singspiration hymnal song. That, that was entitled, I think, Neither Do I Condemn Me. Do you, do you remember that one? Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so Jesus is neither do I condemn me. So what is the next point? The point is no condemnation. No condemnation. Are we all sinners? No. Yeah. yeah. Do we all deserve to die in our sins? Yeah. Absolutely. 
But when we believe in Jesus Christ, then something miraculous happens. Nothing changes in the fact that we are guilty of sin. That did not change. What changed was we are no longer under the condemnation, the sentence. And the sentence of sin is death. So for those of you that follow our, our morning devotionals, this I have this coming week coming up. And um, uh, it's hard for me to, to not kind of, you know, sometimes when I get up here, my Sunday school lessons or my sermons or my, my devotionals, they all get intermingled in my head, you know. <laughs> but I'm talking about this, this no condemnation uh, to some extent. It's some, some pretty good stuff, so you might want to, want to listen to those this week. But here, here is the, the, the idea, and that is that with belief, we cross over from condemned to uncondemned. Uncondemned. So the question is, did she believe? She's standing before her Lord. She's accused. Now, I've heard some, and I'm not going to say it, absolutely not, that the whole thing might have been a total lie, and that she actually wasn't caught in adultery. I don't know. But, even, but that actually doesn't matter. So the next question then, or the, or the reason I have Lord in quotes there. Why do you think I have Lord in quotes? She called him Lord. She called him Lord. If there's any evidence that she, at some point during this whole thing, believed in Jesus, perhaps it's in the fact that she called him Lord. So, whether or not she was actually guilty of the crime, doesn't matter. Was she guilty? I would I would say the probabilities is that yes, she was caught in this act. But if the whole thing was set up in the beginning, maybe she, she wasn't. But regardless of that, she still needed to believe in the Lord. And perhaps <coughs> she did. And so because of that, regardless there was no condemnation. Somebody read for me Romans 8, 1. Mark? Yes. Um, do you think maybe at that moment she believed once he did what he did? That's when she said she called him Lord. Yeah. Uh, although remember she called him Lord before he said to her, neither do I condemn called him Lord before he said that to her. Hmm. So, what's Romans 8 1 say? There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. No condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. There it is. Yes, Larry. The devil's family condemnations. God's family, no condemnation. No condemnation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, the final point that I have for you today is the one that Doug brought up. In your outline, the, 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 uh, it, the word salvation is the answer. Salvation, then repentance. So, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what I, and, and I'm going to preface this with, I have not always believed this. But I'm in a different place in my understanding um, of what salvation is all about. Um, so, ten years ago, if, if you just uh, asked me, is repentance part of salvation? I would have said, absolutely, you better repent or you won't be saved. And I still believe that in the proper context. In the proper context. Okay? Um, 
I was, uh, what was it? Oh, it was two Wednesday nights ago. I shared a video of a supposed Christian teacher who was, uh, uh, he was gay, and he was a big, active proponent of accepting LGBTQ as part of a Christian lifestyle, that it's okay to do that. And he, as part of this video, was explaining what the word repentance means. Uh, who was there? You guys were there. You remember what he said in that? The repentance, a two-part word. First part, this is what this guy said. Expand your mind. The word repentance. It's met, metanoia, I think, something like that. And it's a two-part word. And the first part he said was expand your mind. Meta, expand your mind, right? Expand. And and then the other part was, um, geez, what did he say about that? Anyway, he, he's, he was completely wrong about the definition of the word repentance. Okay? The word is a two-part word, but the first part of that word is not expand your mind. It is change your mind. That's what it means. To change your mind. So when we come to the Lord and we hear the gospel message, and I am totally in agreement with the fact that God loved us before we ever loved Him, and that He drew us to Him, I don't, ex I don't try to explain it because I don't understand it. But every one of us here, if we know the Lord is our Savior, you know there was a point in your life where everything came together at the right place at the right time for you to be ready to hear the gospel and respond to it. And when you did that, part of that gospel message is, what did we say right up front today? We are all sinners. We need a Savior because we're all sinners. And so I need to agree with God. And that means I need to change my mind about that. Because people want to hear the message that they are not a sinner. That they're okay. That they don't have to do anything to have a relationship with God. One point in my life, I thought I was going to become, this before I went into EMS, I thought I was going to go into law enforcement. And so I was going through the process of becoming a CHP officer. And I was at the point of having my oral board interview. And they had, I think it was three, I think it was only three, maybe four, but it was only three people on this board. And before I got, had gone in there to talk to them, they had like two or three questions that they wanted uh, everybody to write out a narrative uh, answering of those questions. And one of the questions was, why do we need to have law enforcement? <laughs> Seems like a pertinent question right now, especially, doesn't it? Why do we need law enforcement? Why does de defund the police not work? And it's proving already that it isn't working, right? Well, why? Well, I, I had already been a pastor. I was pastor, had pastored the church in Reading. I was down in Anaheim at the time with my parents. And I thought, you know, I don't know what direction the Lord's sending me, so I, I need to take care of my family. Let me go be a cop. You know? uh, thank you, Lord, that you had other plans for me. <laughs> so I was writing the answer to that question. And my Christianity kind of slipped in there a little bit. And I wrote something to the effect that we need law enforcement because we are naturally lawbreakers. <laughs> so when I got to the board, the two CHP officers, they didn't have a problem with that. Why? Because they saw it every day in their lives. They saw how many lawbreakers are in our society, right? But there was another person on the board, and it was a lady, and she was the citizen uh, representative. And boy, she laid into me. I'm not a lawbreaker. 
I don't break laws. I mean, and, and I mean, as soon as that happened, I go, okay, I'm sunk. I'm not going to be a CHP officer. <laughs> because she took great issue with the fact that I claim that everybody, to some degree, is a lawbreaker. So that's part of the gospel message, right? I'm a sinner. I'm a lawbreaker. I need a savior. And so repentance is me changing my mind about that and agreeing with God. Yes, I am. And in that context, I believe that repentance is part of the salvation process. But here's, you know, here the biggest part of the word repentance is not about what happened when we're saved. It's what happens after we're saved. And so, you know, I've, I've pictured this for you before. You know, my, mind, my, 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 my life, I'm walking my life. So what happens? Okay, well, you know, for a while I'm walking the straight and narrow. And then, oops, I go off. And then I have to stop. Well, what do I have to do? Back up, get back on the straight and narrow, and go forward. That's me. That's my life. And when I get off, and I stop, and go back, what is that? That's repentance. So I am living a life of continuous repentance. Every time I get off, I have to stop. And sometimes, sometimes I recognize it pretty quickly. Other times... God has to use a two before upside my head. <laughs> right? But I have to stop on my tracks, realize, oh man, I got off here. Repent. Turn my back on that direction that I was going. And get back on track. And then go forward again. And that's my life. Continually. So, yeah, did somebody say? I was saying everybody's life. Everybody's life. That's right. It really is. And so here's here's my final thought for you. Um, God does not expect us to do what is impossible for us to do. So if repentance and salvation means that I turn my back on sin and forevermore never follow sin, is that even possible? You know, I do okay for a while. And then I, then I have to stop and repent again. So if repentance is part of the condition, of the context of, of the word in that, if that's part of it, does that mean that I lost my salvation and I need to be saved all over again? I don't, I, I don't think so. And so one, one scripture for you, um, and I realize that this may be like something, whoa, I've never heard this before, I'm not sure I agree with it. That's okay, but um, Matthew chapter 5. 33 to 37. That's not your notes. Matthew chapter 5. Thirty-three to thirty-seven. I'll just read it for us. So you can follow along. Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, 33. Of course, this is Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking. And he says, Again, you've heard that it's uh, it's been said uh, by them of old. Thou shalt uh, not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. So here's the context. He's talking about oaths. You know what an oath is? It's what I've done a million times. Lord, I'm never going to sin again for the rest of my life. <laughs> right? Okay. But I say to you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne. Hmm. Neither by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Let not your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatever is more than, than these cometh of evil. What is Jesus saying? Don't tell me you're never going to sin again in your life because you don't have that capability. 
You can't even change the color of your hair. What hair I have left is not the same color I was born with. <laughs> I have nothing to do with it. Right? Did you have something to say? Oh, I was just going to say before you already said it. Yeah. That we're not in control. We're not in control. We need the grace of God. And That's right. We need constant contact with Him so right. we can stay on the right path. Right. Because right. in our own, yeah. our own merit, we're going to be Yeah, thing. absolutely. So, when I was growing up in church, you know, I was a preacher's kid, right? And we would have, on a regular basis, an old-fashioned altar call. Every, every service, old-fashioned altar, altar call. And people would come forward and kneel down and pray. And the pastor would come, my dad and myself, uh, after I became a pastor, we'd come and we'd, we would whisper, you know, is there anything I can help you with? And they might need to be saved. And we could lead them to the Lord right there on the spot. And sometimes, let me tell you something. For whatever reason, it was usually the Sunday night service more than the Sunday morning service. The congregation would be singing the invitation hymn. You go through every verse and start all over again because there were so many people coming down. And you just keep singing because you wanted to allow people to have the time to, to do what they needed to do with the Lord. So sometimes it was people need to be saved. Sometimes it was people that had something going on in their life that they needed help with, prayer, right? And other times it was somebody who had recognized that they had been off and needed to repent and come back. And we had a phrase that we used when that was the case. And, and a lot of times after, after the service was over, somebody that had ex accepted the Lord or decided to be baptized or decided to rededicate my life to the Lord. That was the phrase we used. I've got, I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. And they would stand up at the end of the service and everybody would come by and hug them and shake them and tell them that they're with them. It was a, it was a beautiful thing in a lot of ways. Okay? But what I know now is that I don't have to, once every six months, go into the Baptist confessional and rededicate my life to the Lord. I need to do it every day. Yes. Every day. I need to repent every day. Every time I keep catch myself going off. Bring myself back. And then continue continue forward in the Lord. Alright, I hope some of this meant something to you. Any questions, comments? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because uh, they don't, something is drawn to the Lord. Yes. They might not be there, and they're asking for you to support things they don't even know what they can understand. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I kind of struggle with that. Yeah. Because that's not the Bible. Yeah. That yes. No, the sinner's prayer, no, it's not the Bible. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I, for me, the, the, the one place in the Bible that most simply defines salvation is in the Gospel of John. And John, every time he talks about salvation, it's belief. Whoever believes. So then, so then we have to d perhaps dig a little bit deeper. Well, okay, well, what do I need to believe? And that's where part of the Gospel message, Jesus, the perfect man, died on Calvary, he died as uh, in your place, and you need to believe that you as a sinner can trust in the salvation that he bought for you. There's a lot of different ways that we could word it, but it's the same concept. You do that. You believe, and boy, that's it. Now, it's up to us to begin to live a life for the Lord after that of service, and that's where the real repentance kicks in on a continual basis almost. Yes, Nancy. It isn't what? No. It's in your heart, yeah. 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 You know what? I've always kind of felt like, you know what? Obviously, God knew what I was going to do. He knew when I was going to say, yes, Lord, I believe. 
right? He knew that. So for me, it was sitting in that car after Sunday service because I was so scared to go up front as a kid, you know. And, and, and I have an idea that, that the Lord was just kind of smiling and shaking his head yes because he knew that I was already there in my heart. Mm-hmm. I was already there. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, so. Cindy. Cindy. Um, because it says on here, the earliest manuscripts do not include that passage. Yes. Of course, I have to the light. Yes. And it was very interesting where one of them says, as for why it doesn't appear earlier, some say it was removed by those who feared women would feel freedom to commit adultery. <laughs> really? And this is for maybe a little yeah, yeah. adulterous in the story. Later scribes overruled that decision in the service. Yeah. Uh, and I forgot to mention that up front. This this section of scripture that we just looked at, there are some that, that don't believe it was part of the original canon of, of scripture, but it was, was added later. That doesn't bother me uh, because it's truth, um, and I and I trust that the Lord, you know, had you know His purposes in the truth that we have, and I don't have to be afraid of of what's said in this section of scripture because it's all truth. It, it is all truth. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's weird because sometimes the, the oldest manuscripts, even, you know, you think the oldest manuscripts, that's always right, you know, but, um, and I'm not a, you know, a scholar in this sense, but I do know that when comparing like King James or New King James with New American Standard or, or uh, ESV or whatever, there's, some of that is, certain translations are based on certain sets of manuscripts. And I'm not afraid of either one of them uh, because you know when you understand the context of what it's what it's giving you there, um, then it, it works out. It makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us today. Help us, Lord, to continue to look in your Word with open hearts and open minds. Help us, Lord, to. Just, just simply take what your word says. And um, sometimes we know, Lord, that we have to dig in, that we have to um, go a little deeper and find out some of the things that um, make the context as, as right as we can get it in order to understand your scripture. We know that some of you know, your scripture is hard to understand. Uh, even Peter himself referred to the, to the writings of the Apostle Paul as being hard to understand sometimes. So we're all human. We, we have these challenges. But don't let us be afraid, Lord. We can, we can dive in and we can come away with the truth that you want us to have. And know that your book is a living book and that it will always just hold deeper and deeper truths each time that we uh, study it and look into it and, and want to know more of you. Thank you that you are our Father that you have given us your spirit, the spirit of truth, and that he will lead us to the ultimate truth, and that together we will all enjoy an everlasting life with you as we believe the things that you have given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.